For a brief moment in 1990, Pepsi was the sixth largest navy in the world in terms of ships owned. Yes, you heard that right. For a while, Pepsi had more battleships than most countries did. They were more prepared for a naval war than some governments, and they were just a company that sold drinks. But how and why exactly did this happen? Were they gearing up for a war of annihilation against Coca-Cola? Not exactly, but the actual reason is pretty strange as well. On April 9, 1990, Pepsi struck a highly unusual deal with the Soviet Union. The agreement was worth $3 billion in total, which would be over $6 billion today, adjusted for inflation. That's a lot of money. For years, the Soviets have been trading Stolokhnaya vodka to Pepsi in exchange for Pepsi concentrate, which is what you would use to actually make Pepsi. PepsiCo had been given exportation and Western marketing rights to the Soviet vodka brand. Because of this deal, which had been going on since 1972, Pepsi became the first American consumer product to be produced, marketed, and sold within the Soviet Union. As for Stolignaya Vodka, it continued to be made even after the collapse of the USSR and exported to ex-Soviet countries such as Ukraine. The bottles even kept their Soviet-era labels. This was how the deal usually went down. The Soviets gave PepsiCo vodka, and PepsiCo gave the Soviets Pepsi Concentrate. But in 1990, they decided to switch it up and trade 10 Navy ships for Pepsi. A slightly different arrangement. Pepsi didn't actually want the ships for battling naval foes or even for shipping things across the ocean. They just wanted them for the scrap metal, which they sold. But how exactly did any of this get started? Why did the anti-capitalist Soviet Union even allow a sugary American capitalist product onto their shores? Weren't they worried that if their citizens got a taste of sweet freedom, that everything would go off the rails? The Pepsi-Soviet deal can be traced back to the American National Exhibition in Sokolniki Park in the summer of 1959. The Soviets had their own exhibition in New York the same year. The U.S. version featured a wide variety of American products such as cars, clothes, art, and even an entire model American house so that the Russians could see how suburban Americans lived. Some parts of the exhibition were unbelievable to the Russians, the house in particular. One Russian news agency said at the time, there is no more truth in showing this as the typical home of the American worker than, say, in showing the Taj Mahal as the typical home of a Bombay textile worker. Disney, IBM, and Pepsi were some of the companies that had booths at the exhibition. Coca-Cola declined to be part of the exhibition and thus missed out on the Soviet market. At least they did for the time being. Their revenge would come later. The exhibition was a big deal and had 3 million visitors. It is best known for reasons unrelated to Pepsi, namely the so-called kitchen debate between President Richard Nixon and Soviet First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev. This impromptu informal conversation started at a model kitchen table at the exhibition. Later, it was continued at a television studio and broadcast to both countries. They argued over the merits of capitalism versus communism and the topics of discussion ranged from kitchen appliances to nuclear warfare. Sort of like family gatherings when people drink too much. Some historians look back on this exhibition as a positive step in the right direction for both countries. Others point out that the Cuban Missile Crisis happened just a year later, so it probably actually didn't accomplish too much. Maybe it didn't accomplish too much for the U.S. government, but it accomplished a lot for Pepsi. Pepsi didn't have to deal with the Cuban Missile Crisis after all. A lot of Russians got their first ever taste of Pepsi at the exhibition. Even Khrushchev himself tried it for the first time. He drank some with Nixon at a booth that offered two different batches of Pepsi, one mixed with American water and one with Russian water. This was not a chance occurrence. It was a planned marketing stunt by Pepsi. The previous night, a Pepsi executive named Donald M. Kendall went up to Nixon at the American embassy and told Nixon he had to, quote, get a Pepsi in Khrushchev's hand. He was desperate for this whole exhibition thing to work out in Pepsi's favor, since the company's leaders had actually not wanted to go. Kendall had to prove that the whole thing had been a good idea, since it was his idea. He would look like an idiot if Pepsi wasted all this money trying to market their product to Russia, and then they never even got to sell it there. Luckily for him, Nixon made it happen. A photographer took this picture of Nixon and Khrushchev drinking Pepsi together. Kendall is the one to the left, pouring another cup. Khrushchev's son would later say that many Russians' first impression of Pepsi was that it smelled similar to shoe wax. Not exactly love at first sip. However, he also said that everyone remembered it even after the exhibition was over. Maybe Russians just used delicious shoe wax. Or maybe the Soviets were just beginning to understand the true addictive power of sugar water. 
The exhibition and the photo specifically were a big win for Kendall. Six years later, he was the CEO of Pepsi and had huge plans for expansion into Russia. Unlike Napoleon and Hitler's plans to break into Russia, however, Kendall's went pretty well. He successfully negotiated a cola monopoly with the USSR in 1972, banning Coca-Cola until 1985. Obviously, a move like this would be impossible in the United States, but Russians had no problem handing the reins over to a single company. The New York Times called Pepsi the first capitalistic product, available for sale in the Soviet Union. Coca-Cola probably regretted not showing up to the exhibition. There was only one problem, and that was money. Outside of Russia, Soviet rubles were totally worthless. Their value was determined solely by the Kremlin. PepsiCo getting paid for their drinks in rubles would basically be like getting paid in Monopoly money. I mean, it was technically Monopoly money, but not that kind of Monopoly money. You get what I'm saying. Soviet law also banned taking rubles abroad anyway, so they had to work something else out. They returned a good old bartering system. I give you something you want, you give me something I want. No currency required. If it was good enough for pre-civilization man, then it's good enough for a multi-billion dollar deal, I guess. The Soviets got Pepsi and PepsiCo got vodka. Pepsi was a smash hit in the communist country. By the late 80s, Russians were drinking a billion servings of Pepsi every year. In 1988, Pepsi broadcast commercials on local Russian TV starring Michael Jackson. Stolignaya vodka was also popular in the US, although not really to the same degree. Which makes sense, since vodka goes down just a little harder than Pepsi and is slightly less family friendly. So why not stick with this? Why branch out into trading warships? Well, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, there was an American boycott of Stolignaya, so Pepsi wanted something else from the Soviets. Since vodka and money weren't going to work, they went with 17 submarines and three warships, a frigate, a cruiser, and a destroyer. Pepsi sold them all for scraps since the soda company didn't exactly have any use for them as is. Pepsi also got some new Soviet oil tankers and leased them out or sold them. This new trade actually ended up working better than the old one. Scrap metal and oil tankers ended up being more valuable than vodka, which tastes pretty disgusting if everyone is being honest with themselves. Pepsi doubled the number of factories they had in the Soviet Union. There were a lot of jokes in the news at the time that Pepsi was escalating their war against Coca-Cola. Kendall told Brent Scowcroft, President George H.W. Bush's national security advisor, quote, We're disarming the Soviet Union faster than you are. This deal wasn't just some sort of weird oddity that Pepsi was doing, just so they could say they owned submarines or to intimidate Coca-Cola. At the time, it was the largest deal ever made between an American company and the Soviet Union. Pepsi got along with the Russians so well that they sent another one of their products overseas as well, Pizza Hut. Everything was going great. It was looking like the best strategic move Pepsi had ever made, until the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991. All of a sudden, Pepsi's golden deal turned into an attempt to protect their assets that were stuck in Russia. Borders were getting redrawn, inflation was hitting new highs, and the messy process of privatization was beginning. PepsiCo developed serious supply chain problems. The mozzarella they needed for Pizza Hut's was now stuck in Lithuania. They had been planning on bottling Pepsi in cheap plastic instead of heavy glass bottles, but the plastic company was in Belarus now. Everything was just a lot easier for Pepsi when their trade partners still ran everything with an iron fist. The ships that Pepsi was supposed to be getting were now stuck in Ukraine, which was now an independent country. They wanted a cut of the sales, which complicated the whole thing even further. Over the course of several months, Pepsi managed to get parts of the historic deal back together again. But now, instead of just dealing with the Soviet Union, they had to make separate deals with 15 different countries. This was way less efficient, Clearly, these countries did not have the best interest of PepsiCo in mind when they selfishly decided to escape from the tyrannical grip of the Soviets. As if things couldn't get any worse for Pepsi, their monopoly was also over now. Coca-Cola jumped into the Russian market, and now they had to battle it out with them, just like they did in America. Pepsi put together a new marketing strategy to try and keep their edge. It involved launching a huge replica Pepsi can into space for the Mir space station for a commercial. To this day, Russia is still Pepsi's second biggest market, right after the United States. But Coca-Cola is the number one cola in Russia. The Russian fascination with Pepsi has faded, and Pepsi is no longer the sixth biggest navy in the world. They're not even in the top ten. In fact, I'm pretty sure they no longer have any navy at all. But they did at one point, and that's something Coca-Cola can never take away from them. 
If you enjoyed this video, consider giving us a like. If you want to see more rad history, be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching.